Welcome back to the Neuroscience Meets Social and Emotional Learning Podcast, episode number 111. With a returning guest whose interview, episode number 74, made an impact on many of our listeners and me as we were right in the first few months of the pandemic, and it was last July of 2020. While many of my questions for Horatio Sanchez were focused on his book, The Education Revolution, published by Corwin Press, that addresses the decline in empathy, increase in obesity, and the impact of implicit bias on minority students, our conversation turned to focus on the problems we were seeing in the world at the moment, and this was July of 2020. Highlighting the need for racial change through an understanding of race and culture. I knew that Horatio was deep into his next book called The Poverty Problem, How Education Can Promote Resilience and Counter Poverty's Impact on Brain Development, but I hadn't read it, nor had I made the connection between this book, the implicit biases that we all have, how to understand where they originated from in order to self-correct them, and where to even begin to make these changes. If you have not yet watched our first interview, I highly recommend reviewing it before this one. But first, let me just tell you a bit about Horatio. Horatio Sanchez, who is recognized as one of the nation's prominent experts on promoting student resiliency and applying brain science to improve school outcomes as they relate to diverse topics, such as overcoming the impact of poverty, improving school climate, engaging in brain-based instruction, and addressing issues related to implicit bias. His new book was just released in January of this year, The Poverty Problem, How Education Can Promote Resilience and Counter Poverty's Impact on Brain Development and Functioning. If you follow Horatio on Twitter, go to at Resiliency Inc., you'll see the excitement this book is creating with educators around the country who are receiving their books attending his trainings, and learning how to improve outcomes for students in poverty by understanding their developing brains. I highly recommend following Horatio on LinkedIn as he has daily brain tips where he shares these tips and how they're relevant for student learning. Horatio's new book covers how economic hardship is changing our students' brain structure at a genetic level, producing psychological, behavioral, and cognitive issues that dramatically impact learning, behavior, physical health, and emotional stability. But there is hope. Horatio offers solutions that will change minds, attitudes, and behaviors. You'll learn how problems develop between people of different races, how the brain develops in persistent poverty, and how it might react to solutions. In addition, you'll learn more about the lack of culturally competent instruction and its impact on students of color, poverty's effect on language development, the importance of reading, and how to counteract the effects of the widespread stress on low SES environments. Remember, children make up 23% of the U.S. population and account for almost 33% of those living in poverty, making the education system our most distressed institution. In the poverty problem, you'll learn how to increase students' perseverance and confidence and positively impact outcomes by arming yourself with research-based instructional strategies that are inspiring, realistic, and proven to work. Let's hear from Horatio Sanchez. Welcome back, Horatio. It's wonderful to see you again, even though I feel like we've kept in touch since last July through other projects, social media, and I'm always learning something from your posts on LinkedIn. Thank you so much for coming back on the podcast to talk about your new book, The Poverty Problem. It's a pleasure to be here. It's kind of just like hanging out with a friend. (laughs) It really is. Thanks so much. You know, when I was preparing for this ratio, I went back and I looked at our last interview and our discussion on the changes needed to take place in our educational system as it relates to the lack of culturally competent instruction and its impact on students of color. And we talked about this with some ideas of change. 
And I wonder what you think needs to happen now for these changes to take place with clear science-based strategies. Where would you start? Um, one of the problems I see is that um, many of the overriding issues that seem to, to pertain to certain groups like Blacks or Hispanics is that the circumstance you see now is not understood why it's there. And as a result, people are attributing the, what they're seeing to, to things that are not true. So for example, the concentration of Blacks in poverty, if you don't understand it, you'd make some false assumptions like maybe they're not out of poverty because they're not, don't have the drive or they don't have the intellect or other reasons that are not true. And one of the things we think schools need to start doing is actually discussing social political context. And in my book, I spend a lot of time showing that if you do social political context for some of these overriding things you see in society, you actually demystify them and show why they occur and that there are good reasons that they're there. And suddenly, instead of thinking it's just because of, of those people or us, you start to understand that the circumstances that were placed upon us socially and politically produce the outcome that we're seeing now. And, and how important this is, is because when you move generations away from what caused something, people who are even in it don't know and they can have a misperception. So I think education needs to be able to do that. One of the other things I strongly have an opinion of is education seems to do this emphasis when it comes to, to subgroups on focusing on struggle um, because so much of their history is focused on struggle and that has become the de facto history. Here's one of the things that happened that became very interesting in my research that I, I think has influenced education here. We looked at places that were having civil conflict between groups that had different race or cultures and the genocide that was going on or long-term conflicts like in Palestine. And one of the things they looked at was what happens to the children who were raised in the midst of this conflict? And they, the research found a really interesting thing. If the education they received focused on why they're in the conflict, the history of the conflict, and that was the emphasis, there was a greater degree of dislike for the other group, um, maladjustment, anger. However, there was this subpopulation right in the same conflict and their education had a lot to do with people who looked like them, who achieved great things to contribute to society. And that, that minor adjustment seemed to produce more people that were better adjusted, were able to overcome the emphasis on conflict and more willing to be accepting. Well, if we go, went back and look at our curriculum, one of the things I've seen and one of the things we do with experiments when we get educators together is we show that what we know about certain groups in America is basically conflict. The curriculum has to reflect the contributions made by people who look like the students that were contributions to society, not just to their people, to society. And if you infuse the curriculum that way, then everyone sitting there starts to one, know that people who look like them have contributed, but also other students start to be aware of that and that may help people start to be more accepting that people are more than this struggle. So in poverty problem, do you actually have a section for educators to begin to implement this or how would you do that if you're working with a school? We actually did social political context on two issues. One was on the um, the perception of blacks being in poverty and showing what happened in America that produced the concentration of blacks in America. 
So we did that. We also did the demystifying of the implicit bias of blacks related to black males related to violence. And we showed the social political context that had that occur. So if you just go back to, to poverty, one of the things you have to consider is that in the South at a certain point, when, when they did convict leasing, they made it illegal to be unemployed, but they enforced that law primarily with black males, um, which caused large numbers of black males to be arrested. And, and why would you hire someone if you can then have them incarcerated and they do labor for you cheap and, and free? <laughs> so, or, or at very low budgets. When you got the Great Depression, one of the things that concessions for getting the out of the Great Depression and the legislation passed to get people back to work was for the Southern Congress to be willing to allow that to happen. What they did was infuse some rules that the overall party decided to say, okay, let's do this to get this legislation passed. And one of the things were to give priorities to white males over black males for employment, um, to reduce or not to allow housing if you are going to uh, a neighborhood that's not predominantly white, so you couldn't get housing in those situations. All these things were designed to give preference to a group. Well, the middle class in America out of the Great Depression came out of those initiatives. If, you, if the programs decided to exclude blacks and the work they did, like not allowing for social security for farming and house care, which were two of the biggest things that blacks were involved in, everything was designed to undermine the movement out of poverty. Those are called social political context. So if you understand that, you say, well, there is a reason when you had this early concentration and that perpetuated because out of that came a pattern that was hard to break. Got it. So understanding this helps to demystify it and helps with the implicit bias that we form with these groups. Is that the idea? Right. So you start, your students then are then discussing, this is what we see today. Here are the reasons we see this. If you don't do that, it's just, this is what you see today and your brain will kind of figure out a reason. Well, this group constantly is poor, therefore this group must have some issues. And that's what your brain will do by itself. Your brain sees a pattern, your brain determines reasons for the pattern and the reasons are more complex and our curriculum really doesn't discuss it. Got it. It's a, a really good solution to moving forward here. And so your book is called The Poverty Problem. And whenever I'm working on my questions and thinking about questions for you, I keep going to poverty solution. I don't know why. Can I just ask why did you start off with calling it the poverty problem? And what does this do to our brain? Because it's definitely done something to mine just right off the bat. And, and I'm a solution oriented person. I know exactly what you're saying. Um, but I think when it comes to titles of books, um, if you get too cute, people don't know what the book's about. Yeah. <laughs> so um, one of the things that I think is people know exactly what it's about when they pick it up, but you're right. The focus of this book is solutions. Mm -hmm. But the, the other reason I entitled The Poverty Problem is that it is a different problem. We're not talking about what you're thinking. This book is saying that poverty is actually changing and poverty is transforming the brain. Mm -hmm. And the things that poverty is doing to the brain is impacting students cognitively, um, self-control, um, social ability in a very new way. And therefore it is a new problem. It is not the old problem. Everybody's thinking poverty problem, the old way of thinking. And I'm trying to tell you, no, it's a different problem. And if you don't recognize the problem is different, there is no hopes for solution. But I also did not say, here's the problem, let's, let's consider it. I spent a lot of time when we started the book, the emphasis in every chapter was solutions. Yeah. That was clear. 
Can you explain how the outcome of poverty's load compromises decision making regardless of intellect? Like what is it doing to us? So you're referring to cognitive load and, and cognitive load is basically this concept that says, if your brain perseverates on certain issues, can get to a level of being so overwhelmed, it reduces executive capacity, therefore compromising decision-making, cognitive load. There was a theory put out there that poverty by itself produces cognitive load. The definitive experiment came out of India where they went and they looked at sugarcane farmers and the sugarcane farmers basically do very well in India. They usually have one big crop a year. They're flush with cash right after the crop and usually have enough money to make it comfortably to the next crop. So what they did was two months after the initial harvest, they tested a large number of sugarcane farmers, IQ test, um, emotional stability, fluid intellect. Then they came back two months before the next harvest. That meant if you did really well, you're still fine. But there was a small section of farmers that had unexpected things happen and they were struggling at this point. They tested all the farmers and they found out the folks who were experiencing poverty at that moment, just for a short period of time, dropped in IQ 17 points also on an average and dropped in emotional control and fluid intellect. But that is temporary poverty. So we now know if you are fluent and suddenly today you are destitute, in about a couple months, poverty will actually diminish cognitive load, influence decision making. But that is just temporary or, or momentary poverty. In this case, it is worse. Poverty depletes prefrontal cortex, and the more you are in poverty, the more severe, the more destitute, the more it impacts it. One of the ways it impacts the prefrontal cortex is it drops gray matter. Gray matter is the, the substance that shows how well a region of the brain functions. So it reduces the function. Well, one of the places there's a drop in gray matter is the prefrontal cortex. Guess what determines decision-making? The prefrontal cortex. So now you have cognitive load, the stress of poverty by itself, already diminishing cognitive load, diminishing decision-making, and now you have the attack on the prefrontal cortex and put them both together, and now you have extremely compromised decision-making, which, ex which explains what you see in poverty, where many people oftentimes will do bad decisions, which has nothing to do with their intellectual capacity. It has to do with both things the stress, the cognitive load of poverty, and the diminishing capacity of the prefrontal cortex, much worse. And so this has probably been magnified due to the coronavirus, the pandemic, with jobs being lost. I don't know anybody who hasn't noticed a financial hit in some way, let alone if you were already struggling. What do you think? Uh, yeah, and I, I think one of the things, one of the things people should be very concerned about and schools should be concerned about. Um, we have just expanded the, the group that is considered poor in America and you're having brand new experiences where people may not have been poor but their cognitive load is gonna be compromised. But the other thing you have to be considering is this, if you stay in poverty and don't get back out of it, every generation becomes harder to escape because you're then depleting the capacity you need to be able to get out of poverty because the more destitute you become and every generation becomes more severe, you're actually reducing the chances of escape. So the people who have the best chance of getting out of poverty are first generation poverty people. And that's why people coming in from another country and enter poverty oftentimes have the best chance of getting out because they haven't been living in the situation and therefore the capacities to still get out of it are a little bit better. So I'm just trying to think because we can't save the world as much <laughs> as your book, put it in all the schools, would love to see poverty turn around. What outcomes would you think about how could 
schools turn around poverty with changing the students thinking or a teacher's thinking? What, what would be your vision for where you see poverty turning to save some people? Well, I, I actually think schools can do the job, but it will require them to do it differently. We now know that you can do certain things to improve not only brain function, but brain structure. So if you're lacking in gray matter, certain things can be done that no, not only improve the prefrontal cortex function, but also increases gray matter. If you're a compromised white matter, there are certain things we see that if you do it, actually improve that. So there's, so in many ways, schools can do both. They can actually teach in a way where a person can learn and learning helps the brain by itself. But you can also do things that actually improve the brain's structure and functioning to help capacity issues. So for example, um, we now know that true music intervention not only improves language function, but it also seems to change brain structure. And so it may be need to do something slightly different in this case because it will be dramatically, dramatically help students. For example, let's think of language for a second. One of the reasons poverty attacks language is because it attacks the prefrontal lobes that actually involved in language but it also attacks the auditory process because we now know that many infants coming out of poverty do not hear certain discrete sounds well. So you have the regions of language compromised. You also have the auditory piece compromised. Well, certain research found out is if you actually practice and play an instrument for a period of time, one of the things that gets restored is auditory processing. And it doesn't mean you have to get you don't have to get really like great at it. It's persistent practice. But not only does auditory process increase, it seems to help the development of those regions because many of the pathways we do while we're practicing language seems to influence that. So now we've, we've helped the auditory process, we've helped some of the structures, and now we just have to then do the instructional pieces that would actually work very well. So I actually think schools could do a lot in this area. And, and I, I think all it takes is a modification to the instruction in certain ways. Well, that's a powerful tip. I always heard of the importance of music. And I remember there was a time when schools started getting rid of PE and the music. And I remember a lot of the music um, celebrities were doing campaigns for the schools to save it. And it really does help to, to hear why. But I, I, am, I am actually not talking about the music program as in the more traditional go to music every once in a while in schools. I'm talking about the change I'm talking about is a consistent daily participation in a way where everyone is encouraged to do it and does some aspect of it on a regular basis because it takes that repetitive practice to change brain structure. So when I'm not trying to advocate for what we have now, I'm trying to advocate for something more than we have now. And so I'm talking about something far more intense like a real intense music program in which every kid participates on a regular daily basis to help transform the brain. Wow. Well, Horatio, we talked about the fact that poverty, and we all know it leads to negative self-image, but how can we teach our children the important character skills necessary to build their own life path where they might feel that they didn't even have a chance to begin with if they're you know, maybe they've been in poverty for a while, struggling, and they can't see a way out in their own self-image or identity. Well, I'm going to take this in a very different way. Okay. Success is the number one thing you need to have because success gives dopamine. Dopamine gives motivation. The cycle we need is forward. 
oftentimes self-esteem issues in schools relates to a lack of success. Mm -hmm. um, I go to school and I do great. School is not a problem. Um, you don't see kids that are doing great at school going, I don't want to go. Mm -hmm. The problem is me saying to you, hey, you can do it, is insufficient. You have to be able to get these students to believe they can be successful. But far more than just saying it, you have to make it into a concrete um, capacity where they now believe it. Let me give you an example. Um, the foundations for this is what is called embodied cognition. And embodied cognition says many abstract concepts, the brain wants to anchor it to something concrete. Success is an abstract concept, but we know certain skills are critical for being successful at school. So for example, if, if memory is a skill that you have to have to do well at school. If you go to school and remember nothing, the chances of you doing well at school is very low. One of the things that's compromised by, by poverty is memory. How do I know that? Because memory is, is undermined by stress. And when I say the word stress, I pray that people are not thinking the stress that they go through. Um, when we talk about the stress and poverty, it's actually slightly different. Um, one of the most shocking things I discovered in writing this book was that some research started looking at baby stress levels through saliva and found that kids in poverty were demonstrated elevated cortisol at seven months. They came back several times between the first two years of life and every time they came back, it was still elevated. So it wasn't a case of oh, something happened in my life, I experienced stress, then it went down. They're saying that poverty from infancy seems to elevate low-grade stress all the way through, and then stress and poverty goes from already stressed up and more. This is one of the best explanations for comorbidity studies showing what? Just the stress of poverty can actually cause early death because ongoing stress constantly undermines body functions. So we already know if you're in poverty, memory is going to be compromised. So if you're going to be successful at school, I will have to tell you certain skills that we will actually make you good at that will help you be good at school. And if memory is one of them, we build a skill, you practice it regularly. As your memory improves, guess what will improve? Your ability to retain content. Once you start retaining content better, what will you do? You'll test a little better. Once you test a little better, what you'll experience? Success then dopamine secretes, then you got someone starting to do better and moving forward. So in this case, it's more than just the outcome. You have to go back to the racial is issue. What are the skill sets that we have to do so the kid can believe that they can be successful? The minute those skills start to be present, the person then starts to say, I can be successful, and then success will be its own motivator. So when I say self-image in this case is, build through concrete skills. If I start doing better, believe me, my image of self will do better. But right now in education, you have a, a whole group of kids who are struggling and they never get to the place where they believe. And then basically school is nothing more than a sentence in which they're trying to make it to the end of the sentence, which is when they can no longer have to go. That's a lousy existence. And now it's starting to happen where kids feel they don't belong in school, not in high school, not in middle school. We have kids in elementary schools that are starting to think school isn't for them. That's, that's disappointing. It really is. And when you were talking, I was thinking, cause I've got two girls and one does well in school and the other, it's a lot of effort and the self-image self-esteem isn't there. And we've done everything from growth mindset. And I'm thinking, how, what else could we do to bring this up? You know, when she doesn't have a skill trying to teach her, well, I don't have it yet, the growth mindset. Do you see growth mindset helping a student with self-image or do we have to just get them these skills that they're lacking to get them the results to make them feel happy? I, I think 
you you have to get skills sooner or later. I mean, that's just no way about it. It's, it's the question is what skills that are needed can be developed the quickest, because starting from the place of I am more likely to do this well is a great way to go about it. The other thing I think oftentimes we are so linear in our thinking. We think, well, a person lacks this, so we have to attack it this way. Many skill sets are attacked very different ways. Um, for example, one of the reasons many people our age actually have a better memory than younger kids today is that the things we played as children actually increased our memory dramatically. Many of the games we played were actually required a lot of memory. So in many ways, we got a lot of skills in practice because it was so much fun and we did it over and over again and we played it that we got memory capacity. Um, and so someone lacking in certain things, sometimes you can get that in different ways because there are other ways to approach the same kinds of building of the brain that are not, not don't feed into that person's deficits. So there are things that you might be able to do where she can have a lot of fun, she can engage in it, she can like it and still do the same exact thing, building the things you need to build because she's doing it, but she's doing it another way and you just tricked her because she now is learning and doesn't even know she's doing it. I think that's sometimes the best way to go about it. Love it. Yeah, because it can be the, the, the solution. We talk about it all the time here. If reading is difficult, the solution isn't go sit down and read. That's not going to move the needle at all. And it's really it really has helped me to understand how the brain learns to read. And a lot that you're talking about, the strengthening of certain pathways, it really does help from a parent's point of view. And I know from a teaching point of view, I, I know that we talked about protective risk factors in our last interview to help students for low SES thrive beyond the classroom. But what about strategies parents can use, you know, just at home, if they're having a difficult time after the pandemic, what other things could we be thinking of to get through these difficult times to the other side? Well, the goal is homeostasis, and homeostasis is the range that we perform best at. Um, the stress, the things that we go through in, in, in life oftentimes challenge that. But we have hardwired things in our lives that are designed to promote balance and homeostasis. If I'm a parent, one of the first things I'll tell you is, to any parent, is having set routines and rituals in your life are critical. Here's the reason why. If I participate in a ritual regularly, just the fact that it occurs and I predict it's gonna occur and I participate in it gives me dopamine. Just because that's what habits do. Rituals are habits and habits give you dopamine. So guess you may get up in the morning, you make your bed. You think it's just a chore. That simple activity, once you get to the place where you do it regularly, gives you dopamine. So you actually have changed brain function and, and brain chemistry by participating in regular things. So routines and rituals help kids. The other thing is, this, is that sleeping and eating are foundational to everything we do. So set bedtimes, healthy sleeping habits, because when we sleep, our brains are recalibrated, our brains function better. What we put into our bodies is critical for the brain. And let's be honest, a healthier diet, avoiding processed foods, uh, avoiding sugars and fats, those are essential things for helping health. And so those are foundational, routines and rituals. Um, healthy diet, healthy exercise. Those are things that help your kids. Then there is the relationship, having good relationships with your kids because you become a de-stressor. Me and you get along. We have a, a good rapport. When me and you get uh, with each other, guess what would happen? It will elevate our oxytocin. 
guess what happens when oxytocin is elevated? It automatically suppresses cortisol. So you, you as a person becomes an intervention if you are a nurturing, supportive person. If you are a stressful person, then you are a stressor. But if you are a supportive person, you enhance. Those are foundational things. Then the other piece, of course, is this. Kids need to build protectives and continue to build them because protective factors make them more resilient. So if you take the list of protective factors I list there, every single one that's there, anyone they add makes them stronger. So look at them. Every, every competency a kid gets, it doesn't matter what kind of competency, makes them stronger. That's why you can go get your, if your daughter can go build a competency in something that she's very capable in, guess what? It will make her stronger. And so resiliency ends up being a, a positive approach to deficit building because instead of looking at deficits, you're saying, what protective factors can we add? And the more you add, the more capable a person becomes. So I think parents should always take a look at what are the protective factors, which ones we can get and build stronger kids and stop thinking about what we shouldn't be doing or what we shouldn't have happen and start thinking about what we could get into their lives and make them stronger. Oh, I love it. I love it. As you were talking about routines though, I did have something I wanna ask you. How do you get your kids to stick to routines? Like something simple, like make your bed every day. It seems like uh, I say it every day, but they don't listen. Is there a different way I could be saying it so that I'm, still being a nurturing, caring. Yeah, I think, I think saying, reducing saying as much as possible helps because um, um, language re resistance is not necessarily what you want to do. I think, I think sometimes you set up reminders, you set up things that are easy to do. Um, like for example, for, for many boys, right where they have their get up place where they are, um, get to the mirror to do their wash up. If there is a bed that's, that's made and they say reminder and says, do not pass, go here. Have you done that right there? Let oh. that work for you because that's what it means. Before you do anything else, has this been taken care of? And that's, you tell them that's the picture. I don't need to remind you anymore. And anyway, come in, if they're not done, tap the picture, do something else rather because your voice actually can become quite the negative thing because processing voices when, when things that are resistant oftentimes cause irritation. Reduce language, think about more creative ways to remind folks and, and, and do it that way. I mean, I, I don't even care if you have to text them a picture, it might be a better approach. So think of some, make it fun. I mean, it's to put the picture up there, tap it and smile and let's go with it. I remember that being a strategy in teaching. I remember when a principal came in to observe me in the classroom, it was, you know, trying to learn ways to use our voice less because I had behavioral students. So it was like, how can you get across your message without talking? And I thought, well, how do I do this? I don't know. I should have known you back then. You could have given me these tips. <laughs> my, my students would have done well. But yeah, I, I tell people, shut up and teach. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's hard. It's hard, but that really helps. And is there anything important that you think that is in the poverty problem that I've missed that I haven't asked you about? Uh, well, um, a couple of things. Let's, I, I really want to dis discuss maybe the impact of poverty on empathy. Yeah. Um, first of all, let's, let's unpack why empathy is such a big deal. Empathy is critical for our survival. And we know this because now what is empathy? Empathy is our brains focusing on certain things automatically. Um, face, hands, posture, gestures, tone of voice. And our brains are designed to pick emotional cues and from those interpret what's going on because our brains produce it in our, our, our brains produce the emotional cues in our head producing a chemical experience compatible to the, the person we're watching. So we have a similar experience to the person we're observing. Why is that critical? Well, think about baby, mommy, baby. Baby can't talk, 
mommy looks at baby and can read things. And we know that's important because whatever mommy's moods and things, we now know that in a few months, baby actually is picking up mommy's uptick of emotions or downtick of emotions impacting their chemistry. Right. That constant watching of those emotional cues is empathy and it allows mom and baby to understand each other even without language. Once empathy happens, oxytocin occurs to bond that relationship. And we know it's involved with survival because it produces lactation, feeding. Once empathy and oxytocin occur in dual, automatically dopamine occurs to motivate mom to continue caring for baby. This way, mom is motivated to take care of baby even during tough periods because of the dopamine reinforcer. So it's there for our survival, first of all. We also know empathy is critical for cooperation. So society would have never gone to the place where we as a group were able to build a community or society without cooperation and empathy apparently without empathy, our abilities to cooperate across groups or within a group would be minimal. It is also there for correction. So let's say we did a behavior that caused someone discomfort or pain and we feel guilt because of what we see of their, their, their feelings and we read their emotions, that's supposed to impact us negatively and there we engage in new behaviors so that doesn't happen again. So we're supposed to start correcting our own behavior based on being able to interpret our, the impact that we have on other people. And the last thing is there for us to help us not be violent. Um, it allows us to share in other people's pain. If you understand other people's pain, you're not going to try to administer pain because you understand how it feels. So it helps us in all those areas. Okay. If you start thinking about poverty, the prefrontal um, parts of our brains that are involved in understanding poverty are connected to our limbic that have the entire, there's an emotional system. So every emotion is tied into a prefrontal piece and all the way back to the limbic system. Well, poverty attacks the gray matter in the prefrontal piece and also reduces the white matter, the connections, making those connections less operative, dropping empathy. Now let's look at the dark side of empathy. The dark side of empathy is this, and it comes from a very honest place. I love mom, I'm looking at mom. I love dad, I'm looking at dad. Mom and dad are looking at me. And, and together we create a bond. But we also, that bond also creates what is called an in-group preference. Mm -hmm. So strong that before age 10, all the study shows that kids already start to have what? Preference for not only mom and dad, but for people who look like mom or dad. Here's the catch. We all end up then with a pre-group, in-group preference. And in-group preference means I have a little less desire for cooperation out-group, um, caring about what my feelings did to other people, then self-correction drops a little, and then maybe violence or my willingness to engage in things that harm people get a little higher, out-group versus in-group. But if you reduce empathy capacity, here's what we see. You're less capable of doing those behaviors that are required within the group. That means you show less cooperation. You're more willing not to do co corrective action. You're more willing to be a little more violent within your own group. What the hell you think happens with out group? Your care for out group is really significantly lowered. That is one of the reasons we see what? A greater level of animosity from people of poverty, regardless of race or culture for people out group. So poverty undermines empathy, which is the thing that makes us human. And one of the reasons that we need to understand this because it becomes critical. Um, you asked, is there anything else we want to talk about before we leave? Well, if we're going to do this poverty thing, one of the things I'm thinking is we should consider because we already, cons we, we already, we already have poverty concentrated. Let's be honest. Um, 
you can go to certain schools and you know that's a school that's a poverty school that's a poverty school, because there are community schools and poverty is concentrated in communities so we already have schools that are what poor schools for poor students i would like to propose something why don't we have those schools do it differently it's, let's be honest kids from poverty already need certain things we already know what they need we know they're going to show up with issues of focus because that's a prefrontal cortex issue we know we're going to have issues of memory we know we're going to have lots of language issues we know we're going to have to promote self-regulation and self so you can teach emotional control so our curriculums attack those things from the very beginning and do it in ways that are great and entertaining because we're going to promote music we're going to promote emotional control through activities we're going to create um educational pieces that actually involve the body more because that is one of the ways to overcome a lot of deficits and we're going to slightly alter the curriculum so it is reflective of things that make them stronger both self image and across the board what's there to lose because you already know it's this school and this school and this school and if those schools were allowed to do it differently guess what we might see we might see it changing because you see right now when we say people we need to do with deal with the poverty issue it's us versus them so it's like we have to do it for them the narrative here is different i want you to consider attacking poverty for yourself it, to make a better society for us it's not us versus for us the average salary of someone incarcerated at the time of incarceration in america is $13,000 what about if we changed how we educated transforming the brain restoring the brain and also increasing knowledge and those kids actually learn more enjoy it more and are more apt to escape the cycle and every one of them escaping improves my life because i'm improving society for me and here's the other thing i'd like you to consider i put money that if you did that you know what would happen in a few years instead of that school and that school and that school being that school I bet you you have people going I want to go to that school because that approach to education is so much more attractive that I am guaranteeing that it will become so much more attractive that the people will go I want to go to the poor school how about that yeah. how about flipping that narrative wouldn't that be cool and because it is the place that you could get a lot of things that everybody wants for education anyway what do we have to lose um the approach we're doing right now is swimming upstream and we're not doing this for them we're doing it for ourselves because if we do it for us and change the narrative because the brain is driven by self-interest if we do it for them we will quit if we do it for us we're more apt to continue going so why don't we see if people can start figuring out here are the solutions how can we infuse them in those schools and change the cycle this way we're not going to wait for legislatures it's not going to happen we don't need policies we don't need anything we get those kids from preschool on we've always been the place where changes have occurred perhaps maybe someone even out in our audience today maybe they will hear this and they have enough influence and power to go why not let's create different schools for concentration of poverty schools and let us see if we can change the cycle rather than thinking about hey these are the standards and this is the way we've always done it let's continue let's try something different because the poverty problem like you said it's really about the poverty solution So I'm saying let's solve it. Why not?
I love it. Horatio, where have you seen this working? Like as you're talking, there are schools that I've seen and walked onto their campuses and they are schools of poverty, but they are doing things like using brain-based learning and doing some of the things that you're talking about to make a shift. Where have you I, seen, you know, these things? I've seen it working a lot of places, but here, here's the, um, here's the sad truth. What I am envisioning as a great curriculum, I actually have seen it in very affluent schools. Isn't that funky? Yeah. Yeah, yeah and I've seen in some great schools. Many of the things we're talking about are happening in some of the best schools. And it's not because they think these students need it because get out of poverty. They're thinking this is the best way to educate these students. Right. Um, we, there are lots of individual schools that I've gone through across the country that are doing components of it. The problem is I want them to do a lot more in a, a very concentrated approach that says, okay, we know these are the most important things. We are infusing this and we are allowed to do it this way because we are falling into one of those categories of a poor school. So I'm envisioning something a little bit more intense. I want it to happen with greater intensity, with certain things emphasized that are done on a regular basis where this is what we do on a daily basis in this school, transforming minds and making it better. So I'm thinking about something a little bit more potent. Well, I think what you're, you're onto is a solution. And I wanna thank you so much, Horatio, for the time that you've spent with me this time and last time sharing your work with us on the podcast. If anyone wants to learn more about you and work with you directly to take their schools to another level, they can go to resiliencyinc.com, find you on LinkedIn. I highly recommend it. I follow Horatio daily. He posts something about the brain and how it impacts learning on LinkedIn and Twitter. I'll put all those links in the show notes. Uh, you can find the Poverty Problem book through Corwin Press. I'll put those links in. And thank you so much for being here today, Horatio. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. Until next time. Okay. <laughs>